decried election results by questioning the count, and in fact, by calling for a cessation of counting of ballots and his supporters calling for the same ending. Four years ago, this same president's most famous chance were building a wall and locking up a political opponent. This and other incidents have triggered Trump critics to describe his presidency as a fluke in the American experience and look for European and international examples of similar leadership characteristics and tendencies that they describe as fascist. Opposition to free and fair elections, of course, is a hallmark of fascism. Joining us right now, though, is Matthew McWilliams, an internationally recognized expert on authoritarianism, his new book on fascism, 12 Lessons from American History. Matthew, hello. Hello. It's very nice to be on your show. Thank you for having me. Well, it's nice to have you indeed. The Let's start by defining fascism. The concern I have is that it's a word that seems now basically to translate into bad, powerful, and someone with whom I disagree. So before we just throw around that word, let's define it. Well, I think you want to step back a bit from fascism and look at its root. And its root is authoritarianism. Uh, and authoritarians uh, choose authority, obedience, and uniformity over freedom, independence, and diversity. So the taproot is authoritarianism. And it can lead to a lot of different things, hostile sexism, ethnocentrism, and fascism. Fascism itself is something that appeared in the 20th century in Europe. Uh, it is uh, dictatorial power forcible suppression of opposition, as well as strong regimentation of society and the economy. Uh, that's a, a true fascist um, uh, regime. And usually fascist, fascism comes into power by overthrowing of an entire government. Uh, that was not true in the end, obviously, uh, with Hitler. He got, was a, uh, uh, won through election and appointment from uh, 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 but it is not, uh, it was the case in Italy. So that, that's what fascism is. Some of the hallmarks. This isn't from your book. These aren't your 12. But nationalism, disdain for the recognition of human rights, identification of enemies and othering, military supremacy, rampant sexism, focus on national security, government intertwined with religion, I don't know, maybe holding up a Bible and saying this is what gives me the authority. Yeah. Obsession with crime and punishment, such as law and order, rampant cronyism and corruption and fraudulent elections. Which of those, again, do you think are more than just synonyms of a kind of leader we don't like? And which of them are sort of the sine qua non, the defining characteristics of authoritarianism or even fascism? Well, in, in fascism, I, you know, I, I would look at, at Trump particularly and what are, uh, you know, is Trumpism a fascist social political movement? And I would say, yes, it is. And there are key parts of it. One is the strong leader. Two is the cult of leadership amongst around the, the strong leader. Uh, three is disinformation and propaganda, the gaslighting that we saw. And then there's this focus on the myth of national rebirth uh, that is critical uh, to fascism. And then there's use of rituals. And, you know, think of MAGA. Uh, not wearing a mask, which is totally irrational, but not wearing a mask, the chance of lock her up. Uh, and then key to all of this, you know, mass rallies uh, to, to uh, define an in-group versus an out-group, and then othering. Othering is just a key part of fascism because othering allows the strong leader to galvanize power. What about Donald Trump isn't fascist. Now, bear with me for a moment. Again, I, I hesitate. I worry. I mean, I remember when Obama was yeah. president and I saw uh, and I saw right wing activists sharing uh, chimpanzee racist memes and also sharing Hitler memes. And Hitler has become sort of the definition of evil. And therefore, if there's someone you disagree with a lot, like you really, really don't like him, you don't like him, you really, really don't like him. And so then you say, aha, 
you point at Hitler. Say they're like Hitler. Or if you're like my dad, he points at uh, at at Trump and says Mussolini. He reminds me more. Is my dad talking? Reminds me more of Mussolini. But how do we make this a little more clinical? Not just the table thumping of people who wish that a president would do something about climate change and wealth disparities and like democratic norms, etc. But actually something that we can understand and discuss, and that even people who have different voting preferences might be able to agree to at least in a definitional capacity. Yeah, you know, uh, to me, uh, Trump uses fascist political tactics, but I, I, I see him more of as an assassin of democracy, using the uh, term or the, the phrase from uh, how democracy dies. And that is that he has so eroded uh, norms that where he was moving America to was a hollowed out democracy that would then, uh, from his movement, have... Uh, fascist tendencies and those fascist tendencies i think you know are the dictatorial power of a cult leader uh the forcible suppression of opposition and we started to see that and you know right before the election we saw that in executive orders too the civil service executive order which would have gave trump the power to fire anyone that he didn't like in the civil service the 1776 commission which was redefining history whitewashing and sanitizing American history and making it verbatim not to do that. Uh, the diversity executive order. So you saw this creep towards fascism uh, through this hollowing out of democracy. You know, in the end, what would, would we have turned into a fascist state? Uh, that's hard to tell, but we certainly would have been a hollowed out democracy similar to what we see with Viktor Orban in Hungary. So say more about where he fell short. If or where he went different than a fascist dictator, than a fascist leader, what are the ways that you would say Donald Trump is not, was not, might never have become, or at least was stopped from becoming a fascist? Well, he participated in an election, uh, instead, which is pretty big. Now, voter suppression, certainly there. Uh, running, uh, inciting his uh, followers to violence, certainly there. But he did participate in the election. And in the end, uh, it is the institutions of the election, civil servants sitting there counting votes uh, that will undo him, I think. Um, so number one, participating in the election uh, was uh, a critical juncture. Number two, not taking over the economy. True fascist leaders institutionalize, make the economy part of the state. And he had not gotten to that point yet. He had certainly dallied with that, looking at what he was doing with Amazon, uh, how he had been, uh, you know, uh, challenging other corporations, but he had not taken over uh, the, uh, the economy. In your mind, is it, and again, to make the case, to continue along the line the, of the ways in which Donald Trump was never, never became, might never have been, or was stopped short of becoming a fascist dictator, right? And the risk that maybe that was has been overstatement. Maybe it's rhetorically valuable overstatement. Maybe it was rhetorically useful, even threat naming. It was a word that people understood, at least to some degree, or thought that they understood. In your mind, there... Well, I, I can imagine a couple hypotheses, right? One hypothesis is, nah, never was a fascist. That was just a mean word. Another hypothesis is he couldn't quite pull it off. And he couldn't quite pull it off because our military is independent enough from the uh, executive power. It sees itself as a creature not only of the presidency or of the president, but of the state, even though the president is the executive chief. Uh, another might be. Well, the Republican Party has built itself as something that is opposed to state control of the economy. And so if one of the hallmarks is controlling the state, then that might have been something that Mitch McConnell would say, no, 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 the state controlling the economy, we're not going there. Which hypothesis, or maybe there's another, do you uh, adopt, do you subscribe to in sort of comparing and contrasting Donald Trump to true authoritarian dictator, or I understand it's different, true fascist dictator? Yeah, I, I think he's the closest we have come to an authoritarian dictator who could have been uh, uh, turned into a fascist uh, leader, or at least. And and I look at it as his social and political movement that he bought, uh, that he built, 
And he built a, a social and political movement that was fascist, that used fascist techniques. Um, and, and many people have uh, uh, observed that, including uh, Jason Stanley at, at Yale, that this was a fascist and still is a fascist social and political movement. It's not, it lost, but it doesn't mean it's gone away. And that gets me to a question that I wanted to wait until later. And maybe we'll even uh, revisit. We can wait. <laughs> no, no, but it, it's it's now, you know, go where the minds go, right? So yeah, yeah. do you think the defeat of Donald Trump uh, demonstrates the resilience of American democracy? Or do you think that him getting 70 million votes the second time and getting a majority of, of the electoral votes the first time demonstrates a strain that shows deep remaining risk to democracy in this country? I think deep remaining risk in the, to democracy in this country because there are authoritarian people who are disposed to authoritarianism in America. We've known this since the founding. You know, uh, Madison uh, talks about the infection of the violent passions uh, stirred by a self interested leader. This is Federalist 63. Uh, and so we've known that that's part of the American makeup. And the question is, can it be activated? And now it's easier to activate than ever before. You know, the Constitution set up uh, guardrails, boundaries to stop a demagogue, but those boundaries have been eroded. Uh, and specifically, you know, the digital world certainly erodes a lot of those boundaries, but also it counted on a Senate to act in a way that followed their oath of office. And we had a Senate that did not do that, part for many reasons. One was the digital power that uh, Donald Trump has. So to me, we're entering a really difficult time in this country uh, and a dangerous time. And it was, you know, the 2020 election was an amazing, uh, it, it underscored how democracy is hard to kill. It's fragile, but it's hard to kill. But it doesn't mean it's over. 2024 becomes sort of the rubber match to me in this uh, this period that we're in. I want to come back to that, but I also want to go back to something you said, which is, well, Donald Trump participates in elections. Vladimir Putin participates in elections, depending elections. on one's definition <laughs> of participation. Is it really like, and, and maybe it's too semantic and I'm trying to, you know, get my fingers around a slippery bar of soap, but I do this definition of how we know it when there is it, right? How we know, wait, wait, that's the thing we have to be watchful for. It seemed like this country understood that not long after World War II, right? There were lots of people who were very on the alert for the man on the white horse who was going to come in and save us all, but actually subjugate us all, right? It, right? We could think of Napoleon, and we could think of Adolf Hitler, and we could think of Benito Mussolini, and we had enough examples that were present in our minds, and I would argue Mussolini might have reminded us, oh, wait a minute, we forgot that stuff about Napoleon. We should have remembered it. But it sort of feels to me that over the last 10 years, now that nearly every World War II veteran has passed on, we have lost that living memory, and now we sort of forgot the danger, or at least we don't always notice the warning signs. What lessons should we learn from history? I see a nodding or maybe shaking your yeah, head. No, yeah. no, it's a nodding. Yes, exactly. Uh, we have become, and I say this, uh, including myself, lazy when it comes to democracy. Uh, democracy is fragile. We have to be activated in democracy, and it's not just voting. Uh, voting is just part of it. But we have to seize this democracy and work for it. Uh, and if we don't, especially in this digital world that we're in right now, uh, if we allow conspiracy theory arising and uh, uh, alternate fact universes to drive us, we are giving up on democracy. So we have to be very, very watchful. You know, uh, I thought your parallel to Vladimir Putin, Putin controls the economy through his oligarchs. Uh, yeah. And if the oligarchs don't go with him, he kills them. Trump was not at that point yet, but also they do have elections. They just aren't real in uh, uh, Russia. Fortunately, we had an election that was real. If you go to a place like Hungary now, a hollowed out democracy uh, by Viktor Orban, their elections aren't real any longer. That's So it's a, that slippery slope that we have to be careful of. Uh, and also just realizing that the Constitution, the provisions in it to protect us, 
uh, from the demagogue have eroded. And we really have to be on the watch. You look not only to European history or international history or Viktor Orban or Vladimir Putin or Donald Trump to try to understand authoritarianism and try to understand fascism. You point to the United States. You point to examples here that should give us alarm or should teach us lessons or should give us examples. Why the focus on the United States? Or was it surprising to you or should it be surprising to anybody that United States history gives enough fodder for such a book? No, you know, I, I think it's really important uh, to look at our own history because this notion of American exceptionalism gives us sort of a get out of jail free card. Hmm. Uh, we have a lot of dirty laundry at the bottom of our hamper, our historical hamper. But we say, oh, that was an anomaly. We're an exceptional place. Uh, authoritarianism could never happen here. These were historical uh, mistakes and anomalies. And the fact is, they weren't. Uh, that we need to look at those and learn from those. And if we don't reconcile that history, uh, uh, we're doing ourselves a disservice and we're opening ourselves up for an authoritarian leader to take power. You know, it really comes down to we have exceptional founding documents. I mean, the Constitution is a model for constitutions around the world. The Declaration of Independence is an amazing document, enlightenment document. But we're not exceptional people. We're just people. Uh, and we really have to work at our democracy to make it better and stronger. You divide your book into 12 lessons. Where do you want to start? We can start lesson one, I suppose, <laughs> you, you, with yeah. a Lincoln versus Douglas debate, whether the country yeah, should be an one. enlightened country or an authoritarian country. Draw that parallel or make that connection. Yeah, I think the Lincoln-Douglas debate is just a wonderful place to start because the Lincoln-Douglas 1958 election, uh, 1858 election for Senate was a, 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 a campaign about the Declaration of Independence and what the Declaration of Independence meant. And specifically, were all men or people, men, created equal or not? And the backdrop for that uh, was the worst Supreme Court decision ever, the Dred Scott decision in 1857, which said, you know, slaves can't become citizens. Congress can't prohibit, prohibits the spread of slavery, which led to the Civil War. But also it said something really noxious uh, to the Declaration. And this is Roger Taney who wrote, uh, blacks are, quote, beings of an inferior order, so far inferior, they have no rights which the white man was bound to respect. Uh, Douglas took that up and he said, yep, the Declaration of Independence only applies to whites. Uh, he said, you know, the government of ours is founded on the white basis for the benefit of the white man to be administered by white men. Lincoln disagreed with him. Lincoln said, uh, we need to stand up for declaring that all men are created equal. You know, in the fiery trial, Eric Foner's book, he talks about Douglas's racialized definition of America and Lincoln's civic nationalism. Uh, and in the end, you know, Lincoln won. I mean, there wasn't a popular vote for Senate. It was the, uh, but the Republican Party uh, then, Lincoln was a Republican, won the popular vote in the state Senate uh, that year. Um, they won more votes in the state legislature than the Democrats, but because the vote went, uh, it, it, the 17th Amendment of the Constitution had been passed, the legislature was jerry-rigged, gerrymandered, so that the Democrats controlled it even though they lost the popular vote. So just like uh, the Trump's first election, the Electoral College carried Douglas uh, to victory, uh, not the popular vote. Moving on from there, the you have a chapter, All Lives Matter, The Father of Hate Radio and Deep State Conspiracies. That sounds more modern. Yes. Uh, yeah, that is actually, it's, it, it's really one of the beginnings, and this is why I focused on it, the beginnings of uh, an erosion of, of constitutional protections, one of the constitutional protections. And one of the cons uh, protections that Madison talks about in Federalist 63 is the scope, the expanse of the United States. And it would make it hard for a demagogue 
to reach broad numbers of people and build, uh, infect them, the violent passions. Um, with radio uh, and Father Coughlin, that was the first time that that geographic scope of the United States was bridged by big 50,000 watt stations. So now Father Coughlin could go out and reach a large segment of, of Americans with his message. And Father Coughlin was an anti-Semite uh, and uh, a true demagogue and built a, a, a radio empire that moved conspiracy theories, that moved anti-Semitic hate, that, uh, that underscored uh, the, uh, and talked about the protocols of the Elder of Zion, which is one of the early conspiracy, anti-Semitic conspiracy yeah. theories. Uh, and his market power compared to Sean Hannity's is it was exceptional. His uh, in a month he could reach twenty some odd percent of Americans with his voice, and had an audience that large according to Gallup. You know, Sean Hannity in the night has four percent. So, uh, what was the, the impact of Coughlin? So I, I heard of him, and I think a lot of our viewers, listeners, friends have heard of him, are vaguely aware. But in terms of his political impact, I think we can now understand the the impact of Limbaugh and Hannity that begets. Uh, the idea for Fox News, that Fox News sort of does that, puts it on TV, makes it not only, you know, audio attractive, but visually attractive and ends up creating uh, the kind of propaganda mechanism like this country has never seen. I think people understand, a lot of people understand that story. But in terms of the play, and then see how that story connects to the, the uh, phenomenon of Donald Trump, et cetera. I don't know, at least I don't know, how Father Coughlin connected to political impacts, policy choices, decisions and elections in his era. What did you learn about that or what should we know about that? Yeah, he uh, was not all that effective. Uh, Interesting. Uh, and, and one of the keys, you know, the first uh, Roosevelt election against Hoover, uh, he backed Roosevelt, but he wasn't as hateful at that point. He was building uh, the golden hour of the little flower, it was called. He was building his audience at that time. The second election, second time Roosevelt was up, he formed his own party. He couldn't run, but he had a, 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 a candidate who ran his own party, but the candidate did not do that well. Uh, and so his political power was not that great. But at that point, that's when he really turned up and dialed up the hate and the anti-Semitism. Um, but I think he is, you know, he's called the father of hate radio. He shined the light, showed the path forward for what we see today. And he showed that you could monetize, make money by spewing hate and conspiracy theories. And that's what we're seeing now. Now it's digital. Um, and uh, uh, it is a real concern, I think, in terms of our country. Other examples, you point to the Sedition Act as another example that I do think we learn in history class. What might we not know, what might we not remember about the period of 1798 and how that linked up to a, you know, authoritarian fascist threat in this country? Yeah, I think it's another great uh, question. And that is, you know, 1798 was seven years after the Bill of Rights passed, right? So we've had the First Amendment for only seven years. And uh, the Federalists who were running the government at that time saw that they were about to lose power, were worried about that to the uh, Jeffersonians. And so they passed the Sedition Act, which made it a crime to criticize the president in any, or the government in any way, shape, or form. Uh, so it passed, it had a sunset provision in it to end in 1801. Uh, and uh, the government started going around rest, arresting people who spoke out in any way against uh, the, the uh, Adams or the government. And uh, one was uh, Matthew Lyons, who was a sitting congressman put in jail uh, for criticizing uh, the government. He ran from jail and won re-election up in Vermont. And uh, another journalist who was named Thomas Cooper, who was Jefferson uh, considered one of the greatest men in America at that time. He was the editor of a, uh, uh, a journal. Uh, he criticized Adams and was put in jail for it. Uh, convicted uh, in a, uh, a really a, a just a, a 
ridiculous trial, uh, kangaroo court trial, um, and put in jail for six months and uh, paid a fine. When one of my more unpopular views, sir, I tend to have relatively conventional tastes. One of my more unconventional views, more, more unpopular views, unpopular views is I am not a, uh, I am not a Hamilton enthusiast. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I do not worship. I do not you worship. Both. <laughs> I do not worship at the altar of that particular work of art or that particular story. Uh, similarly, with the story of John Adams that was popularized uh, by uh, by you know paid cable, that the debate at the time of the founding of the country was, in my mind, I want you to disabuse me of this if I am wrong, was whether or not we were going to be a little more like England light and have sort of like King light and rules against criticizing King light, light yeah, or yeah. even heavy. And that was Hamilton and Adam's team. And the fact that we are dancing and forgetting those lessons concerns me a little bit. What am I getting wrong? Oh, no, you got it right. I mean, the Sedition Act was all about that. And Thomas Cooper uh, at his trial said, uh, you know, we passed, uh, I'm paraphrasing here, we passed this constitution. I did not know that in passing it that we were uh, appointing a new king who we could not criticize as part of that. Now, that was a real, uh, uh, a real tension. And if you look, what did the Federalists do? They packed the court. Uh, they controlled the court for the next 30 some odd years after they lost the same way <laughs> that Trump has gone to uh, pack the court, not just the Supreme Court, uh, but also uh, the circuit and district courts in this country. That very, very sim a lot of similarities there. But you're you're right. I you know, I'm a I'm a Madisonian, not a Hamiltonian. One I didn't know about that you discussed, and I'm hoping you'll tell us a little bit about is it's another chapter. It's Americans, Lebensraum, and the Treaty of, is it New Ochoa? The, uh, and this is a story I don't think I know, or if I knew it, I've forgotten it. Up, this is this is Cherokee, Cherokee Nation? Is this Cherokee yeah, Nation Cher history? Cherokee right. Nation. Yeah, and Cherokee Nation <clears throat> stretched Georgia, Alabama. It was large in scope uh, when we first came. There were 16 treaties uh, conducted or agreed to between Cherokee Nation and the United States. Cherokee Nation, sovereign nation, consider that under the Constitution, like all Native American uh, uh, tribes. And on each one of those treaties, Cherokee Nation got smaller and smaller and smaller. So we'd agree to a treaty and we'd say, you know, you're giving up this much land. We ensure, the United States of America ensures that the remaining land is yours forever. Uh, then we got to Treaty 15, uh, and gold was found in Cherokee country. And also, Andrew Jackson was president. And Andrew Jackson wanted to remove Native Americans out from the east, out from Georgia, Alabama in the east, and out to, uh, to Indian country, which was Oklahoma. So he had passed first the Indian Removal Act of 1830. And in the Indian Removal Act, it allowed for the movement of, of Native Americans out of their native lands to Cherokee country if the, if the uh, Native Americans would agree to it. So what did Andrew Jackson do? He then sent out people to form, uh, to forge false treaties, treaties that were not real, that the uh, Cherokees and other tribes did not agree to. And in, specifically in terms of the Cherokee, he was very worried about them because they've been uh, become very acculturated to uh, the United States. They had their own constitution. They had a legislature. They had a president. Uh, they even had a, uh, a newspaper. Uh, so Jackson sent in one of his agents to uh, sign a treaty, uh, not with the legislature or the sitting president of Cherokee Nation, but with a rump group that represented no one. And they brought that treaty back, got it passed by the Senate, and gave the uh, Cherokees two years to move out, even though they didn't want to. And then two years came up, the Cherokees didn't move out. And, uh, you know, the, the military was sent in to move them out. And it's a terrible story. You read what happened to these Cherokees, some of them who were very, very wealthy. They were just pulled out of their homes, put on the Trail of Tears where thousands of them died and moved with other Native Americans to 
Indian country. And it's important. This is as good a time as any to make clear that in this analysis, this is not an analysis merely of political parties. Political parties matter a whole lot. To say there are no differences between political parties has always been a lie, has always been a mischaracterization. But on the chance that we have a polytheistic viewership and listenership, on, to be very, very clear, this is not a story of one political party being the force of righteousness and another political party being the sign of the, the forces of evil. In fact, even going back to your Father Coughlin example, it occurred to me probably not quickly enough that one of the things that probably benefited uh, or, or I should say hindered Father Coughlin's ability was that we had, roughly speaking, a bipartisan racist state, right? <coughs> we had, you know, you couldn't go to either the Republicans or the Democrats and be sure that you would find your bastion of power or weakness in that. And in fact, the Democratic Party was still not too far away from having been and hadn't wasn't yet the party of the Civil Rights Act, wasn't yet the party of Lyndon Johnson or the party of John F. Kennedy, was still the party of the Southern Democrats, Dixie Democrats and KKK members, and that probably muddled it a little bit. This is a story of how can we, as a bipartisan, as a multi-transpartisan nation, overcome fascism, embrace democracy in our story and in our future. What am I, you know, either add to that or subtract from it? Or oh, absolutely right. This is not a, a left-right Republican Democrat thing at all. And in fact, if you look at the administration that was closest to taking us down. Um, an authoritarian and potentially fascist uh, uh, path. It was the Wilson administration, hmm. uh, which would have been seen, you know, as a progressive, you know, United Nations. Yeah, you, you don't know, think of that with UN and Princeton. Yeah, you don't. Yeah. You know, I think his name was taken off the uh, uh, the political science building. Yeah, Princeton, Princeton just stopped Princeton. it. He was still president of the place, but the uh, but yeah, we have Wilson High School in my town, and I think they're changing their name too. Here are five things. The Espionage Act of 1917 and the Sedition Act, another Sedition Act of 1918, put free speech under attack under Wilson. The Bureau of Investigation, which Hoover had just started working for as a young man, and the post office started sur electronic surveillance and mail surveillance of Americans under Wilson. Wilson formed the Committee on Public Information, which was a state-run disinformation campaign, propaganda campaign. Uh, and then the Attorney General, Watt Gregory, approved the formation of the American Protective League, which grew to 350,000 people whose job was to look at other Americans and report on them report on them. You know, we have a, a parallel, the total information awareness wanted Americans reporting on Americans too, uh, under Admiral Poindexter. And it finally came down to what Wilson said. Uh, and this is kind of shocking in, in 1917, but this quote that I came across that conformity will be the only virtue under Wilsonism. And every man who refuses to conform will have to pay a penalty. And this was in the ramp up to World War One. You know, he didn't want to be in the war, then he wanted to be in the war. And to say every man who refuses to conform will have to pay a penalty, that to me is a fascist statement. So that's Wilson. He was a progressive. But he was, to be uh, clear, he was, he but he was of Southern origin, right? I mean, this, this was, you know, he, and he played Birth of the Nation in the White House, right? This was not, yes, he, he exactly. was not only a New Jerseyite. In fact, he wasn't a New Jerseyite. He moved there. He was a smart white supremacist from the, from jump. And, but look at his other attorney general, Abe Palmer Mitchell, we wrote about, write about in the Palmer Raids. He was a Quaker pacifist from Pennsylvania who uh, use the power of the Department of Justice in a way that Bill Barr hasn't uh, to lock people up, thousands of people up. Why? For being radicals, uh, mm. for, for talking differently, for having accents. Uh, and he built that, those Palmer raids uh, to, to really uh, run his, to give his campaign for president, a law and order campaign for president, yeah. a leg up. It seems that one of the critical features, maybe a necessary, probably a necessary feature, almost a sufficient feature of a truly fascist regime is a connection to identity, national identity, racial identity. Examples you use include 
the treatment of the United States to Chinese, the treatment of the Japanese internment camps, the Jim Crow and post-Civil War era. Uh, we already discussed the Cherokee Nation. Uh, if we were using the example of Donald Trump and your concerns about that presidency, I'm sure that the Muslim ban and the building yep. a wall is critical to that analysis. Uh, and it also is why. So first, comment on identity and the importance of identity in fascism and why we should still be concerned about it now that we are a more diverse nation than we've ever been. Well, it's exactly why, because we're becoming such a diverse nation or uh, more diverse than we've ever been. Um, and, and, you know, the great seal of the United States is e pluribus unum, out of uh, one out of many, out of many, one. Um, so the notion that is part of our 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 identity as a nation is that we're diverse, but we're one. Uh, that's a good one, Doc. I got to be I got to be using that because was part of the part of our effort here. Part of our effort here is how to help us understand with patriotism the story of the United States in a way that bends the arc of history towards justice, rather than having them things that must yes. be at odds. Yes, and it, it, it's bending it towards justice, and justice is, and the goal of this is out of. Uh, many one and it, the key is not uniformity uh it's unity now with fascism it's uniformity that's important which means there's an in group and an out group and i use that fear of in group versus out group to motivate my people to galvanize my people you have someone to fear as a threat someone to fix uh, to remove that threat, something to fix, someone to blame for not fixing that threat, a group identity uh, that you're with or against. And you then can get to the point where someone who will do what is necessary to protect the group from the outsiders. And that's when you get to, it really paves the way for violence and violations of human rights. Because when you consider someone an other and not part of your uh your uh, polity, that's when you will start cutting corners in terms of their human rights. And this is where I get nervous. So we started out me saying, well, here's the ways that Donald Trump isn't a fascist. This is the ways it was an overstatement. This is the way it's just, you know, liberal hooey. But here's where I got nervous is that you connect identity with a connection with religion. Doesn't have to be Father Coughlin running things. It can just be them singing the same song. Right with a connection to economic oligarchy. Doesn't mean Donald Trump has to run the thing, just has to mean they've got the same hymnal and are doing the same stuff and are working hand in hand. And then you connect it also with control of a media apparatus, not the whole media apparatus, but a bigger media, media apparatus than any political agent has ever had in the history of our country. And if I'm wrong about right. that, please tell me so. No, and it right. does start having the mix that does make me nervous. And if you had a more competent team, a team that was a little bit better at actually running the country, you might actually have had a greater risk that we were in. I went back and forth to whether the dumb stuff he did was something <laughs> that helped him or hurt him. Now that he isn't a second term president, I guess on net, it must have hurt him. But that's where I started to get nervous. How nervous were you? I was very nervous. And, you know, fortunately, I, in some ways, you know, we went from A team Trump to B to C to D. I think we're sort of an F troop Trump at this point. Uh, uh, you know, they're, they're a gang that can't shoot straight. Rudy Giuliani doing his four season landscaping press conference instead of at the Four Seasons Hotel two days ago is an example of it. But I was very, very nervous because we were on the precipice of reelecting Donald Trump and you know, it's not just Trump, it's all the enablers who were enabling him and hollowing out our democracy. And they had broken through so many norms that we are in a dangerous place. You know, we're kind of fortunate that he likes to golf more than he does to plot. Uh, and he cares more about just his own net worth uh, than power. Uh, unlike Putin, who cares about net worth and power. Um, so we were lucky, but, you know, next time we're not going to be as lucky, potentially, uh, which is why we have to be so vigilant. Yeah, and it may have been, and people will continue to write books about this president for years and years, I suspect. Oh, yeah. But it may have been that among his weaknesses was a misunderstanding of power, some really uh, some 
effective power instincts and a power desire, but maybe misunderstanding some of it and understanding what it was like to have people agree with him versus attack him, but actually tr figuring out, like he couldn't have done, for instance, he wasn't in a position to do what Napoleon would do, which was stay up all night writing Napoleonic code and then, you know, rewrite the systems and structures of, of, a, of, of his empire, you know, in the course of some number of weeks or months. He just didn't have the, uh, the mental faculties. He didn't have the ability, didn't have the discipline, didn't have the attention span to do that sort of thing. So maybe his incompetence uh, was a uh, for was a was a savior for Trump critics. I want to switch gears a little bit. The greatest generation has been called defeated fascism in World War II. Uh, do you have an understanding as to what led to fascism's appeal in the United States? Is it any different here than anywhere else? Are there certain strains of our national narrative? Or is it just we are subject to the same risks of identity, uh, disunity, and, and strong papa politics as anybody else? Yeah, that's, that's it. We are, we are uh, the same papa politics, strong leader when, when there's fear uh, is afoot, when, when people can be made afraid that disposition, that authoritarian disposition can get activated. Uh, and, you know, there's just from uh, survey research, 18% of Americans are strong authoritarians. Doesn't mean they act on it all the time, but if they get activated, that's a base. You add another 23%, the next level down, you're over 40%. Who will listen to the siren call of the authoritarian leader? And that siren call is usually driven by fear. And then you add on to it what's happening in this country, which is that white uh, Americans are going to be a minority, not the majority. Uh, we'll be a plurality, but not the majority uh, by, I think, the latest data I saw, and this was 2038. And that scares a lot of people. So you have all that mix going on, and then you have the economic uncertainty. Uh, it's a really, it's a petri dish from which a lot of bad things can grow. Philip K. Roth, uh, Philip Roth wrote a book, uh, now I think an HBO miniseries maybe, The Plot Against America, an yeah. alternative outcome of the 1940 presidential election and allowing the spread of global fascism. From your understanding, uh, with Father Coughlin's market share, with anti-Semitic messaging, how did America avoid, how did the United States avoid joining the side of fascism during, during World War II? You know, uh, Henry Ford world. notwithstanding. Yeah, Henry Ford notwithstanding in the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Uh, uh, I, I think it, it had to do with a few things, uh, but one of the most important things is what side we fought on in World War I. Uh, we were uh, with the Allies, and so it made it unlikely that we'd be uh, fighting uh, World War II. But it wasn't Zion. only about ideology. It was about friends and foes. Yeah, who's, who's your friend? Uh, we've already gone to war with once. And really, World War II was an extension of World War I to a large extent. Uh, a different cast of characters at the top of the German government, uh, but certainly was the next step uh, after that. So I, I think that, uh, that made it unlikely. Uh, also, some of the understanding of what Nazism was doing drove uh, it just seemed un-American to people. And I go to the, you know, in my book, uh, The Night at the Garden, which anyone, you know, should go online and put in Night at the Garden and watch the eight minutes of videotape that has been uh, brought up that shows what happened at that night in the garden. And what happened is it was a, a German-American Bund rally in Madison Square Garden, 20,000 oh, yeah. some odd people, you know, in the back of uh, behind the podium, uh, was a 30-foot George Washington with flags and Nazi symbols. Um, and while there were, you know, 20,000 people in Madison Square Garden that night, there were more outside protesting them. Uh, in fact, they had, I think it was like 1,700 police trying to keep Americans protesting the German-American Bund, which were uh, you know, Hitler, Nazi supporters yeah. uh, from the Americans who just thought it was just a stain and should not be allowed. Well, it's a, uh, I, I, want switch, I want to switch gears again. Uh, Gordon Gecko, a character of fiction that was meant to be an <laughs> example of what not to be, 
in a book that was supposed to be, excuse me, a movie that was supposed to be counter to American greed, Gordon Gecko ends up being a hero yeah. to many a Wall Street trader. And when he says greed is good, instead of telling the audience over time, no, 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 that's why that kind of stuff is bad because we know greed is good, ends up making the case to millions and millions of people that greed is in fact good and launches even more headlong into an era that I don't think Oliver Stone intended. George Orwell writes 1984. The idea is this is all the bad stuff to do. Has it become a how-to manual or is there that risk? Uh, you know, I think a, a fascist or authoritarian leaders and wannabes know how to do it without reaching reading George Orwell. That there is, you know, the, the, if you go back uh, and look, there's a great uh, book uh, or essay written by Irving Berlin, uh, the uh, Crooked Timber of Humanity, which talks about uh, authoritarianism back in the 1850s and 1840s and what was needed. I mean, some of the, the quotes that come out of that essay are amazing. Who to detest, you know, who to other, the notion of a deep state conspiracy, all these things which are current today were talked about uh, in part of uh, uh, when authoritarianism was first defined uh, back in the 1850s. So, I mean, I love George Orwell. I just don't think he's a manual as much as he was just describing what people already knew. Going back to, to the extent they're relevant, my own concerns. So I wasn't only concerned with what was happening in the United States. I saw it was happening in India. I saw it was happening in Brazil. I saw it was what is happening in Russia. I can't leave China out of the equation. Even saw the Brexit vote in uh, in Great Britain. And I started seeing a, I started seeing, I think the world, I think democracy watchers started seeing a world that was embracing uh, authoritarian tendencies. And when, I, and identity linked authoritarian tendencies, I, India being maybe the most potent example. When I and I connect it to the my the 80 year hypothesis, right, that that now that uh, the first example that we've used here was the difference in time between the Revolutionary War and the Civil War, about 80 years, just the time that anybody who fought with Washington had died. Anytime somebody would say, hey, I want to cleave this nation in two, they would no longer have a grandfather. It would have been grandfathers who would have said, smacked him and said, you're not doing that. You don't. I fought with Washington. You don't understand what it took to keep this country together, to make it happen, to build it in the first place. You're not going to tear it asunder. And just as those folks are no longer around as living memory, not a coincidence in my mind that yeah. upward comes a movement to cleave it in two. 80 years mm -hmm. after World War II. Now you don't have the living memory of fighting fascism, of losing and risking life to fight the idea that identity-driven authoritarian politics should rule the world. And all of a sudden, it was maybe a little cooler among some yahoos, and maybe worse than yahoos, to carry their Nazi flag, to carry their, uh, their tiki torch and say, Jews will not replace us. That there wasn't their grandfather or their uncle or their aunt or their, you know, second cousin, whatever, who was living memory. Hey, wait a minute, what are you doing, you idiot? We fought and died and buddies of mine died in order to stop that kind of crap. And 80 years later, sure enough, we see a resurgence. Similarly, we see it around the world. What does this portend? What does this tell us? Either the risk we face around the world or what hope we have that this is a uh, this is a haze of a blip will go away and we'll be OK and democracy will be on the ascendance again. Or am I just too optimistic? Uh, you're too optimistic. We're going to yeah. have to fight to make uh, democracy um, ascendant again. And the whole notion that democracy was is the end game of of politics and governance is just wrong it's fukuyama important. was wrong fukuyama was wrong but i i, I want to add europe uh to uh, the list of nations i want to add oh, yeah. the european union because look at italy the league the, what was the northern league it is league it's an authoritarian uh uh party Look at National Rally, which was National Front in France, an authoritarian party. Look at the Law and Justice Party, the PIS in Poland, an authoritarian party. Uh, and the one place where the authoritarians uh, or the fascists, if you want to put it in this category, and I think we can do it here, have not gotten much purchase. Where was that? Where is it? It's Germany. Mm -hmm. The uh, Alternative for Deutschland, the AFD, 
got 17% in the last German federal election, which shocked the Germans. Uh, and they decided not to engage within the Bundestag with them. They isolated them as a party, uh, which is what you have to do with authoritarian parties. I mean, we know that from how democracies die, but why did they do that? Because since World War II in Germany, there has been an open discussion of what happened in uh, Germany, uh, and it's part of the learning of the German society to never repeat that. Here's what we did. We can never allow that to happen again, which is why I, one of the reasons I wrote my book, I want us to look at our history, look at what we have done. We've done some great, wonderful things, and I'm very proud American, but we've also done some things that are really pretty awful and we need to confront them. Let's just start with 1619 and slavery, and we still haven't reconciled that. Um, so we have to reconcile, we have to face up to this history, we have to reconcile it, and we do it to protect democracy. We don't do it because, oh, free to be you and me. We do it to protect democracy, because if we don't, we don't heal those wounds, those wounds will come back and bite us. The, uh, I, I got a note from my, I got a note from the engineer to ask about anti-fascism. I didn't really want to, but I'm gonna. Uh, and we can edit it out if we want. So the, uh, so there is, because I'm having a hard time characterizing it. Yeah, I do too. You know, 80%, 90% people plus uh, would describe themselves as opposed to fascism. Uh, that said, the word Antifa has been used to describe a certain element of protesters and been used primarily by those who would like to say, like to laud a false equivalency and to say, aha, see, there's there's sort of these forces. And then and if you can characterize Antifa, anti-fascist as bad, as marginalized, as weird, as something one shouldn't support, well, then it's contra, maybe not so bad, maybe in fact good. So the so the the Antifa, the anti-fascist dynamic is a dynamic that's concerning me a lot from rhetorical from rhetorical basis, from a media basis. I think that the presidential election was impacted significantly by I mean, we weren't quite 1968, but we were on our way to be in 1968. Oh, yeah, yeah, we were. Law yeah, go ahead. Give, give your thought about that. Yeah, it was law and order, you know. Don't, those those people who are protesting are bad. No, protest is good. That's part of America. Violence is not good, but protesting is good. That's what we're supposed to be about. That's a First Amendment right the last time I checked. Um, so, yeah, painting anti-fascist Antifa, which I, I, no, I don't know of any, uh, even the FBI does not inc uh, consider the Antifa terrorist organization. They look at white militias as the terrorist organizations. Uh, so trying to make Antifa uh, the boogeyman, the negative, uh, the uh, thing to be concerned about instead of white militias like the Wolverine militia that was planning to take uh, the governor of Michigan, an executor. Uh, it's just gaslighting disinformation. Oh, that was scary. I should have brought that up. Like other oh, things, because yeah, if you was... read, if you read your early totalitarian regime literature, what you recognize the Nazis did early was not by having the military, qual militaries, by having these little private terrorist militia groups that would go out and do their bidding, quell dissent, kill people, at least beat people up, or at very least scare people. And that started when I saw when I saw that when I saw a uh, bus, you know, the the oh, trucks the trying to take over the Biden yeah. bus. That that's this kind of stuff that started making me read real, real nervous. Made me extremely nervous because the boundaries of what is acceptable had been removed and people were doing things that are, you know, really uh, illegal, first of all, but also very corrosive to democracy. Uh, trying to run a bus off the road, going and saying we're going to um, uh, capture a sitting governor, duly elected governor, and we're going to try her and execute her for, for you know, uh, following the laws of her state. Uh, that was very, very concerning. And also there's another point where you know, Trump's rallies where he praised the police uh, for uh, uh, shooting by mistake Ari Velshi, the reporter. He said that was a beautiful sight. That feeding of violence and making violence possible is what is so dangerous. So what needs to happen now? 
We've spanned our view back in history. We've spanned our view to what's happening in other countries from Europe to India. Now let's look ahead. What happens now? Is it a great collective exhale? Aha, democracy is saved. It had <laughs> it had one B2 paid leader threat. He has now been defeated, so everybody take a nap. What happens now? <laughs> oh, we have a lot of work to do. I mean, and by the way, I don't mean it's not a toupee, it's a weave. I don't mean to I don't mean to besmirch yeah. and I shouldn't even mention his appearance. Just now that Trump has been defeated, what happens? Or what, what should happens? happen? Uh, that we cannot walk away and say, everything's great, we won the election, let's go back to the way things were, because things are not the same. Uh, we have a lot of work to do in this country. Um, uh, and, and that work takes in first reestablishing the guardrails of democracy, and we're going to have to demand it, that those guardrails are reestablished. Um, and a lot of that is institutional. Um, but we need to rebuild faith in our institutions, but the institutions have to live up to that faith, and many of them aren't right now. Uh, we have to get back to our fundamental constitutional principles. So there's institutional work. You know, there's personal work that we've got to do, uh, and that is, uh, it's easy to look at the other uh, and to see an enemy, uh, but that enemy is really another American. And so we have to stop calling people libtard snowflake deplorable all these things what about well, fascist uh, well fascist too but it's, unless it, I, they're acting as a fascist but that but that's part of the challenge right where do we name yeah. the thing whether it, or whether and when are we naming the thing or whether we name calling the thing yeah well but it, it's a personal relationship we have to be able to to get outside of our bubbles and talk to each other um and don't revel in the differences because we have real differences in this country. Don't revel in the differences. Let's move towards unity. And then socially, I, I think that we have to make peace with our history. I think a lot of the, our problems right now come from not making peace with our history. And we've made peace at times with our history. We did with the uh, Japanese internment. Um, but we need to make peace with our systemic racism. Um, and then something that uh, people, uh, when I bring this up, they really don't like it, but I think it's really critical. Uh, we have to realize that we're all in this together. And that's not just a flowery statement. We have to put meaning to that. And to me, that means service to our country. And that every kid, uh, when they turn 18 or they graduate from college, needs to start, to needs to join the Hitler Youth. No, a year of service to the country. Well, yeah, no, a year of service to the country. Because if you look at World War II, it was a great leveler. Everyone, most people were in. So if we had Jared and Ivanka and others doing service to the country with people like you and me, then we might have a different country because we'd all be working together. Let's finish it with a call to service and also a call that I just heard for a sense of shared experience. One of the things that with economic and social stratification, we are losing more and more. With that call to service, we'll finish with Matthew McWilliams. The book is on fascism and the feeling, sir, is gratitude. Thanks for being with us. Uh, thank you so much, Jefferson. It was a wonderful interview. I love talking to you. Likewise. Be well. You too, sir.